All right. So we're going to get into probably the most challenging of all of the sermons in this series. Um, I was asking everyone to pray for me at prayer meeting on this because it is a tough topic, as you'll see. Um, So let's get right into it. Um, Revelation chapter 13, as was read so well this morning as our scripture reading, Revelation 13, 15 says, And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save that he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Our message this Sabbath is entitled, The Sunday Law and the Mark of the Beast. The Sunday Law and the Mark of the Beast. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word. We thank you, Lord, for the truths of scripture and the historical evidence that supports it. Well, Lord, in a special way today, I need to ask that you make me a nail on the wall. And Father God, you speak now. We are in need of Holy Ghost power. We need a word from the throne room of grace. So, Lord, you speak. You explain. Lord, you detail. And help us, Lord, to have a full understanding of what is happening. This is our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. So the challenge of this topic simply is that this is one of the points Adventists um, often are attacked on. This is far-fetched to many in Christendom. So I'll just start by laying that out there, that what we're looking at now is actually one of the most difficult concepts in Adventism to really understand. Not difficult to understand, but a lot of people don't really want this to be true, as you'll see. It's not just that people inside, outside the church don't get this or don't believe in it. The truth is, and I'll show you, that even inside the church, there are many who are saying we should no longer teach this. These doctrines that I'm about to present should be tossed, that they are relics of the 1800s and the fabrication of a woman named Ellen White. And with that, you are about to see that this is a key point And I'll start before I even get deep into this, and we we will get deep into it, and we'll go real quick, so um, put your seatbelts on. But um, some folk think that this is a ridiculous test, the idea of which day you worship. But I would remind you that the first test in the entire Bible, in the book of Genesis, was between Eve and a talking serpent, and it was over whether or not to eat a piece of fruit from a specific tree. Now you could argue, what a simple and maybe even silly test. Yet that was the test upon which all our fates were determined if you are a Bible-believing Christian. It was on which tree you ate. And of all the trees, and I would imagine there were at least hundreds of trees in the garden, there was only one they could not eat from. And she... And Adam, ultimately, Adam and Eve, could not be obedient to that simple test. And all the chaos, death, destruction, and despair that is contained on this woeful planet comes because of their bad decision. Once you understand that, this, I think, makes a lot more sense. The tests don't have to be difficult. The tests don't have to be complicated. The test simply has to determine whose allegiance you have. So let's go back to Revelation chapter 13. We're going to go all the way back to verse 11. I was going to read the whole chapter, but for time's sake, we already studied this in, our, in the message, America in Prophecy, um, a little bit also in a little time of trouble. So we're going to hit some things we talked about, but we're going to move now. And Revelation 13, 11 says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And in that left message, we talked about how this beast this lamb-like, uh, the beast with two horns like a lamb, spoke as a dragon, is the United States of America. You can go back and watch it. In fact, I would argue that if you, this is the first time you're seeing me do one of these messages, at least go back to the beginning of the series. But better yet, go back and listen to the series on apologetics. 
Because then you get the understanding of why I trust the Bible the way I trust the Bible. Now, and he exercised all the power of the first beast. Well, who was the first beast? We, we determined in that message, the first beast is the papacy, which is what makes this tough, right? And he caused the earth and them that dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And we talked about this in 1798, Berthier, the Pope's, uh, I'm sorry, Napoleon's general took the Pope at the time captive, brought him to France. He died in captivity. It was a deadly wound. And after 1798, the Vatican, the papacy did not have the power she had before. But the Bible then says that this wound would be healed. And we know that in this century, we have watched that wound be healed. And I'll give you evidence of that, that that wound has been healed. It then says, and he doeth great wonders so that he makes fire come down from heaven in the sight of, uh, uh, from, uh, 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 from heaven on earth in the sight of men. And so here, <laughs> I'm going to add another dimension. That actually one of the things you're going to see happen in these last days is that spiritualism and supernatural manifestations are going to tie the three, um, uh, false religious systems together. And if you remember what they are, they are the three unclean spirits like frogs that come out of the mouth of the beast, the dragon, and the false prophet. The false prophet is the equivalent of this beast. It is the, it is the uh, apostate Protestantism that has rejected the scripture and has gone its own way. Now, spiritualism. Is spiritualism taking the world by storm? Absolutely. If I had time, I would go back. We did a whole message on spiritualism. Everything from the rise of Harry Potter, all of the Disney characters, of Dora the Explorer and the dragon, and I, I could go on and on and on. Spiritualism has pervaded. And at the core of spiritualism is the belief that the dead live. And because people believe that, the dead will be able to give messages to confirm lies, which is why when Jesus in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 3 begins to explain to the disciples what the end of the world will be like, he does not start by giving them signs. We've talked about this many times. He starts by saying, do not be deceived. The Greek word planeo, do not be led away. That's where he starts. The greatest of all the prophets is Jesus. Read um, Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 9. He is the greatest of all the prophets. And he says, don't be deceived. It will be a season of deception. And so they will cause supernatural feats to happen that will cause people to move in ways we think impossible. And I'm going to show you where some of the quote unquote Adventist um, 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 uh, detractors from these teachings believe that there's no way the world could change. Let me tell you something. The world can change fast. I was around for 9-11. And overnight, they passed the Patriot Act in just a few weeks or however long it took. And uh, many of our fundamental freedoms, without our even knowing, were snatched from us. It can happen quickly. It just takes enough fear in society for the world to change. Or it takes miracles. Here, we talked about this last time, but I'm, I'm going to show you just as an example how things can change quickly. Here, the insider, the ex-intel officer who testified the United States has proof of aliens previously made the wild claim that the Vatican was part of a UFO cover-up. They said this was crazy, but there are other people who say, nope. During the time of World War II under Mussolini, you can look this all up yourself, in 1933, the Italians lost to the uh, allies when uh, um, the Americans took it that in fact the Vatican actually helped the allies specifically the Americans get their hands on a UFO it wasn't area 57 that was first it was actually somewhere in Italy you think it's a coincidence or coincidence that these two powers are connected on the issue that has now come to the forefront the issue of UFOs UFOs are back in the news this is America the Jesuit review Here's what the Jesuits say. Let's, let's, we're going to go deep. UFOs are back in the news and Catholics are ready to deal with any theological questions on alien life. Now, if you study the Bible and you understand the great controversy, you know there's nobody coming from another planet to come to visit this one. We are the pariah of the universe. We sinned and they didn't. Right? Nobody wants to come visit us. It's like going on vacation to like somewhere out in the dusty desert in California. Nobody does that, right? But this is what they say. Now, look how deep I'm talking about how the miracles. Stay with me, 
church. This, this, this one today is, is, is a different one. Watch this. Here's what the Jesuit, one of the Jesuits, the Catholic, he says, when asked, it would be will, well, asked if he would be willing to baptize an alien, Jesuit brother Guy Consalmagno said, only if she asked. So wait a minute. Not only are they coming, they might even c- come for an altar call to be baptized. This is Jesuit brother Guy Consol, Consol Magno, head of the Vatican Observatory and sometimes called the Pope's astronomer. After an event of science fiction and theology we did at the Sheen Center for Thought Culture. So this, this is part of this article. The Catholic intellectual tradition stands ready to help humanity interpret and process the fact that we are not alone in the universe. Do you see this? The fact that we are not alone. Now, they, now they're not saying it's like there's other planets um, that God created somewhere else, but that these people are coming... T- I don't know if they're people, but they're coming to earth. What happens when the spirit of the dead and and these aliens, all of whom collectively are the exact same force, the Bible tells you where they come from. It says that the dragon took his tail and he drew with him a third of the stars. What do the stars represent? The stars are the fallen angels. How could aliens actually show up on earth? They're demons. So I want you to get, because here's how I know that there's something nefarious going on. Why would you think the alien needs baptism? How do you think, how do you know the alien fell? How do you know the alien sinned? Because you must know what we know, which is that the aliens are actually demons. Now watch this. It gets deeper. Do aliens exist? Here's what Pope Francis and Vatican astronomer have to say, right? And this is from you Catholic. I'm quoting this stuff. I'm not making this stuff up. This is, this is stuff you can find yourself. This is from the previous article, not from the one to the left here, where Pope Francis Church World, Pope Francis Church would baptize aliens here. However, Pope Francis is sure of one thing about aliens. If they come to earth and ask to be baptized, he would, he would, no qualms about, he would have no qualms about doing so. Did y'all get that? Now, I think he's joking here because I think what he's really trying to do is pitch tolerance that basically if we I'd baptize an alien like I'd baptize anything if tomorrow an expedition of Martians came to us here this is the Pope speaking and said I want to be baptized what would happen Martians right green with long noses and big ears like in children's drawings no that's actually in children's cartoons when the Lord shows us the way who are we to say no Lord it is not prudent no let's do it this way we who are we to close doors to close doors on baptizing green Martians? But I'm not doing this to be to, to ridicule, but I, I want you to understand the times in which you live. It's the first Jesuit pope, and along with his Jesuit astronomer, they're basically saying they would baptize aliens. When there's no aliens, if you study the scripture. Here's what Revelation 13 continues, and it says, and he deceives them to dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles, right? Like having a UFO spaceship, like having the parts of an alien, body parts, which he had power to do on the side of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had a wound by a sword and did live. So it says that the second beast must make an image to the first beast. Let me make it clear. The first beast had characteristics we talked about before. One of them was it was a persecuting power. The second one is that that first beast, uh, that first beast was a union of church and state. And that because of that, it could pass laws that I'm going to show you, laws enforcing religious edicts that went against the Bible. And one of the things you're going to notice today is that we use sola scriptura, the Bible and the Bible alone. Now, let me give you a, a pictorial of this. This is the 1260 days or years of papal supremacy. We talked about it, that it is a time of times, a dividing of time. It is the 40 and two months, the 1260 days, all the different ways it's put out. It started with Justinian. We've talked about that. Ended when the Pope was taken captive by Napoleon's um, um, general. So all of that you've gotten. That during this time, we now call the Dark Ages, because of the complete control and overrunning of the world by one power. And I talked about the fact that even when the colonial powers raised up, like Portugal, Spain, Denmark, and even Great Britain, all of these powerful countries that went and conquered the world, what did they basically bring with them? Catholicism. 
Literally, the Pope took control of all of Latin America, North America, um, 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 uh, Africa, Asia. Vietnam was a Catholic country up until the Vietnam War. I don't know if a lot of people don't know that. The French fought the Viet Cong before the Americans did. The whole world was under its grasp. And then it was weakened. So then the, we go back to Revelation 13. And he had power to give life. This is the second beast. The United States had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause, that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be what? Killed. And I could, if I had time, I could show you that during that 1260 years, that's exactly what happened. So when people say you're crazy to believe that such a thing could happen again, one, they ignore the scripture. Two, they ignore the claims of the Catholic Church that she does not change. And I don't have a quote on that today, but I can throw it in for the next time. Verse 16, and he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, and free and bond, to receive a mark in his right hand or in their foreheads. So unlike the seal of God, which we talked about before, which only goes in the forehead, the forehead representing the frontal lobe, the reasoning centers of the brain, this one can go in two different places. Why? Because you can follow the devil without really ever agreeing with the devil. In other words, if you just flow, we, we, in our Christ object lesson, we were looking at the, the, the parable we just went over last Wednesday night, uh, was the parable of the two sons. Um, and it was, and Ellen White at the end of the chapter says that you can't float into heaven. You, you can't passively be saved. You can't just like, you know, it, it, it's not like, you, you know, you get on the plane and the pilot's like, listen, just sit back and relax and enjoy the ride. You got to pedal. You got to row. You got to do something. Right? So this idea that you can, so those people who think they're just going to float in, they will receive the mark in their hand. And ultimately, this will be, have a lot to do with economics and, the, and not wanting to lose all they've worked for. So you have to be careful in that regard. The Seventh-day Adventist Bible commentary says this about that verse, about the word image, making an image to the verse beast. It's from the Greek Icon, which is where we get the word icon from. Someone's an icon. It's a likeness, an image. It's like a kind of like a statue, like a like an idol. So in 2 Corinthians 4 4 and Colossians 1 15, Christ is spoken of as the icon of God, the, the representative, the image of God. It is the purpose of the plan of salvation to transform man into the icon of Christ. And we are supposed to also be like Christ is like God. We are to become like Christ. An icon implies an archetype and as in many respects is like its archetype. An image to the first beast, now watch this, this is from the SDA Bible commentary, an image to the first beast would be an organization functioning on much the same principle as the beast's organization. Among the principles by which the first beast operated was the use of the secular arm to support religious institutions. Very true. An imitation, in imitation, the second beast will repudiate its principles of freedom. The church will prevail upon the state to enforce its dogmas. State and church will unite, and the result will be the loss of religious liberty and the persecution of dissenting minorities. What the prophecy is telling us is that this second beast will make an image to the first beast. If you study what the first beast did historically during this 1260 years, you know that what the Bible is saying is that this second beast, which we believe is the United States of America, the only United States of America fits the prophecies we talked about, is going to one day fall into that and if you were raised in this born and raised in this country like i was and you went to civics class and u.s history class this seems inconceivable the first amendment the first one to the constitution of the united states guarantees a few of your rights it guarantees your right to free speech it guarantees your fr your right to um free worship or religion it even it, it guarantees your right to assemble to even protest against the government the uh the guarantees the um the right uh, to have um, a free um, um, a media, right, journalism, all of that is wrapped up. So you say to yourself, that's impossible. You'd have to change the Constitution. Not in, there are people who want to change the Constitution. Not impossible. But this is why some people say you Adventists are foolish. America's the greatest country ever. She would never um, go back on what she's done. Rome was once the greatest country ever. And how did she treat people? Revelation 13, 17. And that no man might buy or sell, save that he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And so we know that this law would be attached to 
economics to purchasing to whether or not you could feed your family in the long run. It's all wrapped up right in here. Now, recap. So the second beast will exercise the power of the first beast. Secular power used to persecute the sinners. Will force people to worship the image of the beast. Worship is at the center of this controversy. And here, death is the punishment as well as the inability to sustain, to sustain oneself economically. That's where we are. So we, we've, we've reached that point in the, in the prophecy. Revelation 14.9. We jump forward to the third angel's message. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, What's going to happen to you if you receive this mark? This is why we preach on this. Because God, it, listen, some people say we shouldn't preach this. You know, they're Adventists say you, should, you shouldn't preach this. But if we shouldn't preach it, why is it in the Bible? More than that, why is it in the Bible more than once? Right? And here it is, verse 10. This is the consequence to receiving this mark. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. That is very powerful wording. And the smoke of the, their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receives the mark of his name. They refuse to accept the day of worship and rest, and their punishment is they get no rest. Now to juxtapose the two groups of people that are left. You know, the Bible always leaves you with two groups of people, the sheep and the goat, the wheat and the tear. Right? There's always two groups of people at the end. The wise virgins and the foolish virgins. Always leave you two groups. So if that's the first group and that's their punishment, I want to show you the characteristics of the second group because if you see the characteristics of the second group, you get a better understanding of the topic. Revelation 14, 12 says this. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. I hope you get this. So here, this is the next verse. It juxtaposes what we just talked about. These people get the mark of the beast. They follow this beast. They, 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 they do what he says. What is the difference between that group and this group? They have patience. Jesus says, he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. The Bible says, um, if, uh, a just man falls seven times and rises every time. It then says, he then says, the just shall live by faith. Amen. This is righteousness by faith. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. How do they keep the commandments of God? They go through a process of sanctification. It is by the power of the Holy Spirit. But they do not give in to the enemy. Amen? And then that last piece says, and the faith of Jesus. It can also be translated, and the faith, and the faith, and faith in Jesus. It can go both ways, but I like it, and the faith of Jesus. This group has a certain faith. That's why the next series we're going to do is Righteousness by Faith. That'll be our next series. Going from Martin Luther to 1888 and forward. The faith of Jesus. Here's what's beautiful about Christianity. Your relationship with God is determined by how you trust him, love him, and know him. Right? And so... When you trust him and submit to him, he gives you power to become victorious. The mark of the beast is a mark where people are trying, like the Pharisees, to work out their own salvation in a way that excludes God. And so they come up with their own day of rest, their own system of salvation, separate from what the Bible teaches. I like what Revelation 15 2 kind of expounds on this it says and i saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass having the harps of god you see that so there's another group this group gains victory over the beast so when we talk about the mark of the beast the sunday law some folk get frightened i don't because i read this verse which tells me if I trust God, if I have the faith of Christ in Christ, I'm victorious. I've won in advance. And next time we're going to talk about the close of probation, which scares everybody. People think that all of a sudden they're just going to be walking down the street, boop, the probation just closed. That might happen if something terrible happens to you. But in general, probation is going to close all at once. We'll talk about that. When you understand the Bible, there's no need to be afraid. 
I can't emphasize that enough because when I was growing up, a lot of times I was afraid. There is no need to be afraid once you understand the Bible. If you are in rebellion against God, your fear is justifiable. All right. Recap again. So the description of the juxtaposing groups is that they keep the commandments of God and of the faith of Jesus, the, the group that um, is saved. <clears throat> and the ignoring or breaking of, 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 so this is the question, the ignoring or breaking of which of the Ten Commandments would most easily fool both professed Christians and the world. So most people will agree you shouldn't steal. I don't care what culture you come from, stealing is bad. Most people agree you shouldn't kill. Most people, even as, as, as morally deprived as the world is, people still look down on people who commit adultery, right? There's one of these famous singers, I was reading it in my Apple News, and they said she took, she, she was married, and the other star, star was married, and she took the other star, um, the other person's husband, and it was just all this drama. All of a sudden, it's wrong for this woman to do, but everybody in America living foul, right? So all of the commandments, except for one, no one would have problems if you break it. And that's how you begin to look at where this mark is. The mark, the Greek word charagma in Revelation 14.9 means a scratch or etching. That is a, st is a stamp as a badge of servitude. A mark thus a br is a brand or sign of identification. So let's look at the idea of a mark or a sign. When we look at it, um, the Sabbath is called a sign between God and his people in the Bible. It identifies God's people as being sanctified or set apart by God. Did you guys get that? The Sabbath is a sign that you've been sanctified or set apart. So when people take the Sabbath lightly and say, you know, it doesn't really matter, it's like Eve saying, the serpent saying to Eve, eh, has God really said you shouldn't eat this fruit? It's like just throwing away the word of God. God says what he says. God is powerful. He doesn't just, he doesn't, he doesn't just jibber jabber. He doesn't talk for no reason. Watch this. Exodus 31, 13. Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbath ye shall keep, for it is a what? It is a sign between me and you through your generations that you may know that I am the Lord that doth what? What is the Sabbath a sign of? That you've been sanctified, which means you've been set apart. Verse 17 of the same verse. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth. And on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. Now, so some people say, well, the Sabbath is just for the Jews. So why would I keep the Sabbath? But even when God gives the Sabbath instruction to the actual Jews, he says it's a sign between him and the children of Israel forever. But then he goes back to its origin. When was it made? At creation. Was there any Jews at creation? Nope. Adam nor Eve was Jewish. It was given before sin entered the world. And so it is not to be messed with. It existed before sin, and Isaiah tells us it will exist after sin. Even in the new heaven and the new earth, we will still keep the Sabbath. Now, Exodus 20 and verse 12, moreover also I gave them my Sabbaths to, me, to be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. Mark 2 and 27, Jesus said, and he said unto them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. So was the Sabbath done away by Jesus? Absolutely not. He's the Lord of the Sabbath. He didn't do away with the Sabbath. He kept the Sabbath. The scripture says that as his custom was, he went into the synagogue every Sabbath. Paul also preached in the synagogue on the Sabbath. There are only eight times in the New Testament the first day of the week is mentioned. The first five times is, has to do with the resurrection. None of them have to do with changing the day to the first day of the week. It's not in the Bible. So, if the Sabbath is a mark, a sign for, for God uh, uh, and his people, what would be a mark for the enemy? So, if this, if this day is, is a sign, a mark, that you've been sanctified and set apart by God, if the Sabbath day, this Friday night sunset to Saturday sunset, if that's the Sabbath and that's the sign, what would be a false sign? Well, one, the mark of the beast then, as it's as the sign of the enemy is a general rebellion against the law of God in general, Spe specifically against a particular commandment, the fourth one. And it would have had to have been instituted by the first beast of Revelation 13 if the second beast is making an image to that beast, right? 
So Revelation 13, 5, and there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. So the first beast had a mouth speaking great things. The first beast of Revelation 13, the papacy, spoke blasphemies, and power was given unto him 40 and two months. That's, I showed you the picture. That was the papal supremacy. If you go back to Daniel 7 and verse 25, and he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given unto his hand until the time of times and the dividing of times. He will speak great words. Both of them say he will speak great words. Right? We had one whole message just on that. And they shall be given unto his hand for that same time period. And he shall wear out the saints of the Most High. What does the first beast say his mark is? Catholic records, September 1st, 1923, almost exactly 100 years ago. Sunday is our mark of authority. The church, the church is above the Bible, and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. All right? So let me let, again, don't, don't say I said it. They're going to say it. I'm going to let the beast speak, right? Here it is, the Catholic Catechism. And you can see here, this is a big view of, of the page, but they did a brilliant job. They showed you the Ten Commandments from the Bible. Here's the, here's, um, the way that they change it. This is how it shows up in a traditional uh, catechism formula. And I'm going to make it a little bigger here, and you can see they lump the Second Commandment in with the, uh, the, the Third Commandment. But in the Catechism, it's missing. And then they try and say, well, we didn't really take it away. We didn't hide it. It's there. But they take it away. Why do they take it away? Because it has the one that has to do with idols. So the Bible clear, if you read the, 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 the uh, commandment, that you should not have idols. You should not have graven images. You should not bow down to them. When I went to the Vatican, I thoroughly enjoyed the trip all over Italy. It was wonderful. Best food in all of Europe was in Italy. Got to give it to them. But when I walked in, people were kissing the feet of the statue of Peter. It was pretty disturbing actually because the saliva over the years had worn away the stone and people still kissed it and I'm again I'm not mocking I was only about 14 years old but I knew better than to kiss that statue right you can't kiss statues feet and pray to statues and then say you don't you're not breaking the second and third commandment like you don't get to get it both ways Right? You can't, first of all, who are you praying to? Paul says when you put that statue there, it's a demon behind it. So when you say, I'm praying to St. Lazarus for good luck or for prosperity or whatever you're praying for, you're praying to the dead. And the Bible forbids prayers to the dead. Right? Now, here is um, uh, the fourth commandment. Um, oh, this is the second one. I am the Lord, I your God. You shall have no strange gods before me. That's all the catechism says. But again, there are plenty of statues and so forth this is one of the ways that they changed the laws they made the catechism over and they filled the place of statues there's nowhere in the new testament that would make you think that this is okay definitely not in the old testament but this is what happened so the seventh general council a second of nicaea um jay mendham wrote in the seventh general council the second uh, uh nicaea introduction the worship of images was one of those corruptions of christianity which crept into the church stealthily and almost without notice or observation. This corruption did not, like other heresies, develop itself at once, for in that case it would have been met with decided censure and rebuke. Did you get that? It happened slowly. If they could slowly introduce the idols and the statues, you think Sunday worship could be slowly introduced as well? As a legal format? The images were first introduced into churches not to be worshipped, but either in place of books to give instruction to those who could not read or to excite devotion to the, to the minds of others. But it was found that images brought into churches, watch this, darkened rather than enlightened the minds of the ignorant, degraded rather than exalted the devotion of the worshiper. Profound. It didn't have its desired effect. So Protestants didn't accept that. Here's the Sabbath a commandment in all of its entirety. Here's what it says in the catechism. Remember to keep the Lord's day holy. So notice it no longer is called the Sabbath. Switch to being called the Lord's day. And here's what they say. The Catholic Church for over 1,000 years before the existence of a Protestant by virtue of her divine mission changed the day from Saturday to Sunday. We say by virtue of her divine mission because he who called himself the Lord of the Sabbath, this is why they call it the Lord's day, uh, endowed her with his own power to teach. He that heareth you heareth me. Command, 
commanded all who believed to, he to him to hear her under penalty of being placed with the heathen and the publican. You get that? It's ironic that Jesus sat with the publicans and the sinners and they want to place you with them and promised to be with her to the end of the world. She holds her charter as teacher from him, a charter as infallible as perpetual. The Protestant world at its birth found the Christian Sabbath too strongly entrenched to run counter to its existence. It was therefore placed under the necessity of acquiescing in the arrangement, thus implying, look at this, thus implying the church's right to change the day uh, for over 300 years. You see what they say? Because the Protestant world accepted the, seventh day, the, the first day of the week and rejected the seventh day, she acquiesced and accepted the power of the Church of Rome. Here, from the Catholic Mirror, September 23rd, 1893, the Christian Sabbath is therefore to this day the acknowledged offspring of the Catholic Church as spouse of the Holy Ghost, without a word of remonstrance from the Protestant world. Question, which day is the Sabbath? Answer, Saturday is the Sabbath. This is from the Catholic um, um, a Doctrinal Catechism, 1957 edition, page 50. Question, why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? We observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Council of Laodicea in 8336 transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. This is um, Cardinal James Gibbons. He writes in the Faith of Our Fathers, 92nd edition, page 89. He freely admits you may reread the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and you will not find a single line authorizing sanctification of Sunday. The scriptures enforce the religious observance of Saturday, a day which we, the Catholic Church, never sanctify. From their own word. This one is from our Sunday visitor, February 5th, 1950. Protestants do not realize that by observing Sunday, they accept the authority of the spokesperson of the church, the Pope. The Catholic Church, this is from the Catholic Record of London, Ontario, September 4th, 1923, one year, 100 years ago again. The Catholic Church claims that the church is above the Bible, and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. This is from uh, Storia della Domenica. Not the creator of the universe in Genesis 2, 1 through 3, but the Catholic Church can claim the honor of having granted man a pause to his work every seven days. Bold, bold statement, isn't it? And of course, in 1998, Pope John Paul II, one of the most effective popes, uh, wrote the book, uh, wrote the ecclesiastical uh, letter, uh, Dies Domini, <clears throat> in the Spanish. This is from the Archdiocese of Madrid, Spain. Uh, in Spanish, El Dia del Señor, Dias Domini, on keeping the Lord's Day. If you haven't read it, it's fascinating. Sunday becomes the eighth day of the week in this writing. Ain't but seven days, but it becomes the eighth day. Um, and, and there's all kinds of reasons as to why it should be kept. And one of the things that they did is that they removed the Bible. How do you get people to believe such a powerful lie? M many of my good Catholic friends and relatives when you ask them about these things, they say, listen, we were told, we were taught you should never read the Bible because we are not capable of understanding it. We must get the information from the priest. I've had many of my Catholic friends and relatives tell me that. But the truth is you have to remove the truth of the Bible in order for error to come in like this. Are y'all getting this? So what do they do? Well, in one section of France, this wasn't across the whole thing, the Council of Toulouse, 1229, the Council of Toulouse was met at the, about the time the church began a crusade to wipe out the existence of the Bible-believing Albigenses of Europe, ruled. We prohibit laymen possessing copies of the Old and New Testament. We forbid them most severely to have the above books in the popular vernacular. You can have it in Latin because nobody read Latin. The lords of the district shall carefully seek out the heretics and dwellings, hovels and forests, and even their underground retreats shall be entirely what? Wiped out. For what? For having the truth of the Bible and the Bible itself. So when people say this can't happen, it's happened before. The question is, could it happen again? And they say, no, nah, that would never happen again. The Council of Tarragona, AD 1234, ruled that no one may possess the books of the Old and New Testament in the Romance language, meaning their common language. And if anyone possesses them, he must turn them over to the local bishop within eight days after promulgation of this decree so that they may be burned, lest he be a cleric, uh, lest he, le burned, lest he, be he a cleric or a layman, he is suspected until he is cleared of all suspicion. You have to turn over your Bible and they, what did they do with it? Let me tell you something. You need to be studying your Bible, memorizing scripture, because this could all happen again. Right? And how do you do that? Well, if you take away the Bible, the one New York Times, this is from 1973, 
Vatican reasserts the dogma of the Pope's infallibility. I won't read all of this, but to tell you in the second paragraph, in the 100 years since Vatican I, this authority has been used only once in 1950 when Pope Pius XII solemnly defined a new dogma of the Virgin Mary's bodily assumption to heaven. So the Pope can speak, and even if the Bible doesn't support it, his word takes over. Does the Bible teach that Mary was a perpetual virgin? No, it actually says she had ch other children. Does the Bible teach that she, after she died, was resurrected and taken up to heaven? Absolutely not. Yet, under the infallibility of the Pope, they said that's exactly what happened. I hope y'all are getting this. The infallibility of the Pope is the infallibility of Jesus Christ himself. This is what they say. Whenever the Pope thinks, it is God himself who is thinking in him. That is from Fritz Leist, der Geffen, this German, quoted in Symposium on Revelation. Here it is, the boldest thing. Perhaps the boldest thing, the most revolutionary change the church ever did happened in the first century. The holy day, the Sabbath, was changed from Saturday to Sunday, not from any directions noted in the scripture, but from the church's sense of its own power. People who think that the scriptures should be the sole authority should logically become Seventh-day Adventists and keep the Saturday holy. St. Catholic Catholic Church Sentinel, May 21st, 1995. How powerful is that? That's the actual paper highlighted. This is literally what they said. If you believe that the Bible is the only rule, then you should be a Seventh-day Adventist and you should keep the seven-day Sabbath. Because if you don't do that, what you're saying is that what the papacy did and the Catholic Church has confirmed for many a century is right and you have submitted to his power. You, have, you are worshiping the image of the beast. So is this idea really that crazy? Well, interestingly, we live in the state that was once the center of all Sunday laws. Right? There's the idea of a Sunday law. The blue laws of Connecticut. Connecticut has some of the harshest. Blue. In fact, Washington. Did you know President George Washington was arrested on his way from somewhere in Connecticut to somewhere in New York on a Sunday because he was traveling on a Sunday? And the only reason he, George Washington. I mean, they got statue of this man all over the country. And he got arrested and stopped because he's traveling on a Sunday on his way to church. And the only reason they let him go is he said he wouldn't go no further than the town where the church was in New York. So he said, this could never happen in America. Well, Connecticut has some of the roughest blue. And to this day, go to a grocery store on a Sunday and you'll notice you can't shop the same way on Sunday as you can other days of the week. I'm going to get into that more here in a second. So, Spectrum Magazine, uh, supposedly Adventist Magazine, I would advise you not to read it. Um, says there's an even greater controversy. And in this article, they say, by continuing to ignore how prevailing sentiments in the 1800s influenced the identif identification of the United States and the preoccupation with the enactment of Sunday laws, we might be setting ourselves up for a great disappointment. They say, listen, if you think there's a Sunday law coming, you're setting yourself up for a great disappointment. That's a, that's a loaded word too, huh? They knew what they were saying. Clearly, much of the conditions that prevailed in the late 1800s that made Sunday laws plausible are no longer evident in our time. These include, now look at what they think is necessary for Sunday laws to exist. This tells you they don't even know the Bible, the spirit of prophecy, nothing. They think um, that what made it so possible, these include strong anti-Catholic sentiment in American society and a visible Catholic Protestant divide. Actually, the prophecy teaches the exact opposite. It is because they come together that you get a Sunday law. You know who's writing this stuff? Let me just be honest. These are the enemies of the church. This is, this is the devil himself trying to erode away fundamental beliefs to cause a shaking so that people don't take what we teach seriously. And if we're wrong on these points, why would they believe us on any? Now, it says um, um, uh, agitation of Sunday laws in various states in the United States. So they're saying that that doesn't happen. No one is agitating for Sunday laws now. That's what they say. In, in this article, contentious statements by prominent Catholics such as Cardinal Gibbons, who in 1895 said that Sunday is our mark of authority. I just quoted that, which excited seven Adventist students of prophecy. America's increasing influence as a superpower and a strong colonial drive such as the scramble for Africa in late 1800s that would make a universal Sunday law plausible in the colonies. And so they're wrong on like everything they say there. America really does not begin to become a superpower until after the Second World War, truthfully. Right. I mean, the British Empire was far more powerful up until that time. And 
during the late 1800s, the Bismarck and the Germans, to me, were a much mightier nation than the United States. But we were basically a big country of farms and some cities. Another one. This is AdventistToday.org. Auntie, why did this is dear Auntie Aunt Sevy? I don't know who Aunt Sevy is. She shows no picture of herself. Auntie, who do preachers here? Why do preachers here talk so much about Sunday laws? This is from this month, August 21st, 2023. I want to show you why knowing the Bible and these prophecies is so important. I'm going to read this article. The Bible records that early Christians did suffer. This is what Aunt Sevy says. The Bible records that early Christians did suffer persecution because the Roman Empire looked unfavorably on foreign religious movements. The Bible also correctly warned that future Christians would meet opposition for their beliefs, just as Jesus did himself. And of course, many have and still do. Uh, like, eh, yeah, I mean, it happens. Those people get persecuted. It's a little more serious than this flippant attitude. But watch this. But the notion that the Seventh-day Adventists will be singled out for persecution for keeping the Sabbath because Sunday laws will have made it illegal to go to church on Saturday is the invention of Ellen White, in particular her book, The Great Controversy. How do you call yourself? If, if you don't agree with that, why are you a Seventh-day Adventist? I studied with the Rastafarians, right? I studied with the Nation of Islam. I studied with a whole bunch of people. You know what I didn't join? I didn't agree with what they taught. When they told me Haley Selassie was the emperor and God of the world, I said, eh, that don't make no sense. If he's God, why is Ethiopia in so much trouble? Didn't make sense. I didn't join. Why do people stay in our church when they don't agree with us? Because they are the tear. They're working to destroy the fabric of this denomination. Right? The actual biblical proofs for this in unsubstantial is, is they uh, for this are unsubstantial. Daniel seven twenty five refers to a figure who will speak against the Most High and oppress His holy people and try to change the set times and laws, which Adventist apologists say is about changing Sabbath to Sunday. It's actually not what we say. We say He changed all kinds of stuff, which I can show you from history He did. When did Mary become holy? When did Mary become someone you pray to? When did a priest have the ability to absolve you of sin? And I, I left out so many quotes of them saying, literally, the, pope, the priest in the confessional is equal to Christ. So it's not just the Sabbath. The Sabbath is the one piece we pull out because it is one that prophetically will be, make a difference. Uh, um, she says, which Adventists apologize, uh, the, that passage is that connected with Revelation 13, 6 7, where they say interpreters, uh, uh, the mark of the beast is the pope persecuting Adventists for not worshiping on Sunday. And that's actually, again, not what we actually say. She says, but the Sabbath isn't identified as the problem in either text. And in fact, we see today so little opposition to Sabbath keeping in the real world that a single instance of it is noteworthy. Did you get that? We don't see it, even though I, I, I could I, I almost show you that it's happened and, and, and will happen again. While, uh, look at what she says. While Auntie loves the Sabbath and finds it of great value to her life, she agrees with the church leader and writer, uh, Reiner Brunsma, when he says that the exception that in the end time, a universal Sunday law will be enforced by the civil authorities upon the insistence of the public and at the demand of the apostate churches seems to be more and more unrealistic. This is an Adventist basically teaching against us. In reality, the overall trend is toward less rather than more strict Sunday keeping. Not true. In the Western world, the Sunday of church worship is rapidly being replaced by a Sunday of amusement and shopping. That doesn't mean there won't be a Sunday law. This, they don't get it. Auntie doesn't, look at this. This is the key part I want y'all to get about the deception. Auntie doesn't spend a moment worrying about Sunday laws or any other end time events. She believes that if you nurture trust in God and sincerely try to be like Jesus in your behavior towards others, God will take care of the rest. Then then why did Jesus waste his time to have Matthew, Luke, and Mark write whole chapters in their gospel warning us of the deception and the need to keep the commandments? If what she's saying is true, Jesus was foolish. If the end time events don't really matter, why are they in the Bible? So, where did Sunday laws? Well, Constantine did the first one, March 7, 321. First Sunday law became more inclusive throughout the Dark Ages. This was not a religious one. It wasn't like the Catholic Church did this one. Honestly, it was Constantine. He was a, he was a, he worshiped Mithra. He was a Mithra. They did Mithra, the Roman emperors. The sun was impossible. That's what this thing is here. It was later on under Theodosius the first in 380. He passed a law that all under him be follow, be, uh, uh, follow Roman, follow the Roman Catholic Church. In 386, the first Sunday law with Christian meaning was passed. 386 to 469, seven more laws were passed. I, I was going to get into all that. It's a lot. They started dropping these laws all the time and changed the fabric of, of Europe with these laws. During the Dark Ages, 
the Sunday's laws were strong. So this is during that 1260 years. It says here, if a free man has done servile work on the Lord's day, that is, if he has yoked up oxen and driven about with a cart, he shall lose the right oxen. But if he makes hedges, da, 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 and it says here, if he persists, he shall lose his liberty and be sold as a slave because he would not be free on the Lord's holy day. But the slave shall not be shipped for such a crime. And if he persists, he shall lose his right hand. Now chop off your right hand if you don't do it. Maybe that's why the mark goes on the right hand. And if he frequently transgresses, he shall be a subject to greater punishment. This was during the Dark Ages, even in the United States. The very first such laws enacted in the colony of Virginia in 1610 read as follows. Every man and woman shall repair in the morning to the divine service and sermons preached upon the Sabbath day and in the afternoon to divine service and uh, catechizing upon pain for the first fault to lose their provision and the allowance for the whole week following for the second to lose the said allowance and also be whipped and for the third to suffer death. These, so did Ellen White invent this? She wasn't alive in 1610. This idea of Sunday laws punishable by death predates Ellen White. She didn't fabricate or make this up. It already existed. She was, she was prophesying its return. All right, long, ambiguous history of Connecticut's blue laws. I was going to get into this, but Connecticut has a whole bunch of them. Connecticut was an interesting state on this. Massachusetts as well. Uh, Maryland was another one. And Maryland in 1961, not 1861, 1961, not that long ago, a generation ago, there was a case, um, uh, McGowan, against the state of Maryland. And in this one, several employees at a discount department store, this is in 1961, sold a few items such as floor wax and loose leaf notebooks to customers on a Sunday. By doing so, they violated Maryland's blue laws, which only allow certain items such as drugs, tobacco, you can buy tobacco on Sunday, newspapers, and some food stuff to be sold on Sundays. Do Maryland's blue laws violate the free exercise of religious ex establishment clause of the First Amendment? So they took this case to the Supreme Court. These people worked in a grocery store and sold people some notebooks and toilet paper or something, and uh, a, a, a notebook, sorry, and floor wax, and they got arrested for it. And even when they went to the Maryland Supreme Court, they upheld the first court's verdict that they were guilty of breaking these Sunday laws, blue laws. When it got to the Supreme Court, this is in 1961, the court found that the blue laws did not violate the free exercise clause because the employees allege only economic injury and not infringement on their own religious practices. So then this, the Supreme Court upheld this saying, this is right. You know what that did? It opened the door. Because now you, it, it basically uh, affirmed that you can be punished for breaking a Sunday law. And this wasn't that long ago. So when they say, no, you guys are crazy for believing this, I don't know. This, is, this actually just happened. People went to jail for it. The First Amendment Encyclopedia says, Douglas thought the law created improper establishment of religion. So one of the dissenting justices said, Justice William O. Douglas wrote a, a, a stinging dissension, giving the issue even more attention, starting from the as, uh, assumption that the First Amendment applied equally to state and national governments. Douglas said, I do not see how a state can make protesting citizens refrain from doing innocent acts on Sundays because the doing of those acts offend the sentiments of their Christian neighbors. Citing the majority distinction between beliefs and conduct, he observed, it is a strange bill of rights that makes it possible for the dominant religious group to bring the minority to heel because the minority in the doing of acts which intrinsically are wholesome and not antisocial do, does not defer to the majority religious beliefs. 1961. Now, that's interesting because it was two weeks earlier that the Pope actually, the Pope at the time, in his encyclical of Pope John the 23rd, actually said that they should make Sunday holy. And that government, two weeks before the Supreme Court did that ruling, the Pope said that that's what should happen. Powerful. And then it became basically uh, precedence in the United States. Right? Allied to what we have said so far, the question of the Sunday rest, to safeguard man's dignity as a creature of God, endowed with a soul in the image and likeness of God, the church has always demanded a diligent observance of the third commandment. Did he change the laws? Remember that thou keep the holy, the Sabbath day. Now look, in addition, man has a right to rest for a while for work and indeed a need to do so if he is to renew his bodily strength and to refresh his spirit by suitable recreation. So they say, listen, this is for health and wellness. These laws are good. And you're going to see that they're going to use all kinds of reasons. And there's more here. I won't go into that. 
Um, but what they say, listen, this is this is from the, the Christian Christianity Today. This is from 1976. I'm, I'm going to show you how recent this is because they say we're crazy to believe this. 1970, the Lord's Day of Natural Resources. Harold Lindsay, editor of Christianity Today, May 7, 1960. The editor of Christianity Today wrote, the proper use of the Lord's Day can come about by free choice or it can be legislated. This is Christianity Today, big paper. It is highly unlikely that it will be accomplished by voluntary action of the citizenry generally. Therefore, the only way to accomplish the objective is by force of legislative fiat. Did y'all get that? That was 1976. A lot of us in here are alive in 1976. It's not the dark ages. And yet Christian leaders in a Christian paper are editorializing that this is what should happen. The 1995, we come even closer. Catholic Catechism urges civil recognition of Sunday. The civil authority should be urged, look at this, to cooperate with the church uh, Catholic in maintaining and strengthening this public worship of God and to support with her own authority the regulations set down by the church's pastors. The, they're saying, just like they did during the Dark Ages, it should happen today. But it's only in this way that the faithful will understand why it is Sunday and not the Sabbath day that we now keep holy. The Roman Catechism of 1985. Is it still happening? Well, go to Europe. If you go to Europe, there's a whole thing called the Europe Sunday Alliance. Work, live, uh, time together. The families are Europe's treasure, right? Europe's day of free, uh, of, for a European day for a work-free Sunday. Joint statement of the European Sunday Alliance on the European day for, and this is from March of two years ago. So they say this could never happen. It's happening. It's not that it can't happen. Here it is, right? Sunday, Fafke recalls the need for a weekly common day of rest, crucial for the social cohesion of our communities and the inter intergenerational bond within families. Um, Fafke is the, therefore happy to join the statement of the European Sunday Alliance, a network of more than 100 national Sunday alliances, trade unions, employers, organizations, civil society organizations, churches, and religious communities committed to raise awareness of the unique value of synchronized free time for European societies. That's two years ago they said that. And here's the map. So much of Europe, um, uh, particularly Poland, Germany, they have laws that actually already restrict what you can do on Sunday pretty significantly. Americans need a break, they say. Maybe blue laws can help. So there's a whole push. Remember the word agitation? It, it's being agitated. That is one of the clear signs of the end. It's being agitated. Keeping stores open on Sunday, the Pope says, is beneficial. Uh, keeping stores open on Sunday is not beneficial for society, Pope Francis says. So here, I mean, here it is, the push to change these laws. Why will they do it? Here are some of the reasons they will support a Sunday law. When these Adventists say, no, this is not going to happen, there's three big reasons. One of them is labor issues, right? As, you, as the world becomes more socialism-based, they're going to be saying, we've got to protect the worker. So close down on Sunday so people don't have to work. They're going to say the environment. I'll show you some stuff on that. They're going to say to rectify the moral decline in society. People want back a more moral society. The world has gone upside down. I've given, shown you graphs on the rise in sexually transmitted infections and all the crazy stuff going on. They want the world to go back to the way it was. Maybe if we had Sunday, people would behave better. What does the Bible say? Matthew 24, 7 through 10. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. They say Sunday will unify people. That's the one I missed, right? <clears throat> Labor issues, environmental issues. Jesus actually says that there's going to be a, a catastrophe around the world. You saw this fire in Maui. You never think you see a fire in Maui. It's a, it's a humid, wet place. The fires in Canada, people are saying, we've got to do something. We've got to do something. We've got to do something. Here it is. The Bible says that these things are going to happen. Then it says, after these natural disasters, after the earthquakes, after the racial division, that's what the nation against nation stands for. All these things happening in the world, people are going to say, how do we fix it? Verse 9 tells you the consequences or the result of when they try and fix it. Here it is. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. What is the result? persecution persecution around what well i showed you these slides the other week supreme court showdown over sabbath could change workplace across the united states was it the sabbath it was sunday a postal worker who didn't want to work on sunday supreme court sides with a postal carrier who refused to work on sabbath i've shown you these slides just to show you again this is not far-fetched crazy stuff representative laura bobert calls separation of church and state junk says the church should direct the government 
is an elected official saying this, right? Most Republicans support declaring the United States a Christian nation. And I've said it before, America is not a Christian nation because you say it is. America would only be a Christian nation if Americans became Christians. Start behaving like it. Stop listening to all that foolishness on the radio. Boycotted the movie theaters. Shut down the, that stuff because the love of Christ uh, supersedes the love of the world. If you don't do that, you can, you can, paint, a, a, you can paint a pig brown, but it doesn't become a, a horse, right? Inside, Pope Francis addressed the Congress. We talked about that. Biden, Pope Francis could make a climate change miracle. This is where it is. So because of the environment, and they, it's deep. If you read what uh, some of the people have said about like abortion issues, it is bec- the swing to get rid of uh, abortion um, being legal unified the evangelical churches with the Catholics. Did you know that? What, whatever side you take on the issue of abortion, it succeeded. And Clarence Thomas, I don't have it in this slide, he actually said, what was next? Gay marriage, we can get rid of that. We can get rid of birth, uh, contraception, he said. I want you to get it. As this movement gains momentum, this doesn't become so far-fetched anymore. Here she he is with uh, Greta, I forget her last name. Um, here, join the strike, climate change, and she quote, she's looking at the celebrate his, this is his encyclical, Pope Francis. There's a picture of it, uh, Laudato Si, the Holy Father on care of our, our common home. And he says in here, he calls the whole human family together to hear the call of young people. He praises agencies and organizations for employing legitimate means of pressure to ensure that each government carries out proper and inalienable responsibility. He draws, his paragraph 71 of his encyclical, he draws from the, on the biblical Sabbath laws, such as the weekly Sabbath, the sabbatical year of the rest. So he uses the Sabbath as an example to say this is how we could fix the environment. And then Fox News actually says, let's make Sunday a day of rest for God's sake. Are we crazy as Adventists to believe what we believe? I don't think so. I think if you study the Bible, and I notice I didn't use one word from the spirit of prophecy. This is biblical truth. And history helps you to understand what the Bible is referring to. If I, if I drop it in the spirit of prophecy, it comes crystal clear, but I don't want to do that because people are watching. I want them to understand we, we believe what we believe because the Bible teaches it. So here it is, the chronology of the last day events. I'll show you this again, right? So we're talking here about, um, we talked about the loud cry. We talked about the shaking. Next, we're going to talk about the close of probation, all right? Um, and the Sunday law is here. Right during the shaking time, that's why these people are putting out these articles against this stuff. They're shaking people out of the church, literally. Right, and here's the other one I showed you. There's the Sunday laws here. Um, the death decree for the Sunday law comes after the close of probation. We'll talk about the close of probation next time. And the question really is, <clears throat> what mark, what sign will you receive? Where is your allegiance? Do you take the word of God and frivolously say like Auntie Eki or whatever her name was? Uh, do you say, you know what, eh, I like the Sabbath, but eh, you know, no big deal? Or do you take the word of God seriously? Because that's the call of the last days, that we trust what Jesus says. Here it is, Revelation 15, last couple of verses. Revelation 15, 2 says, And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. And them that had gotten victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over his, the number of his name, Stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. Here's what I want us to be able to do, church. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Do you want to be able to sing the song of Moses and the Lamb? Then he says this. John writes in Revelation 15, 4, Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. Papacy is not holy. There's no holy see. Only God is holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. And my plea to you today as we close is this. Worship him now in spirit and in truth in every aspect of your life, that one day you'll be able to stand on a sea of glass mingled with fire and sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. But you you don't get to sing that song if you can't sing one now. 
You don't get to stand and follow the lamb whithersoever he goeth then if you can't follow the lamb now. If you are following the enemy now, if, if Netflix is your scripture and the radio is your worship song, all the secular filth that they put out, if that is where you are, your mind is being molded from now to receive the mark of the beast. And I challenge you, go into your prayer closet and ask God, to agitate inside of you, to shake out that which what does not belong, to remove from your character the stain of this world and the habits of this world. Now is the time. You know, we're going to talk about this next message. It's not the second coming you actually got to get ready for. It's the close of probation. Before Jesus actually closed, your fate will already have been sealed. If the close of probation happened today, would you be ready? Don't receive the mark. Stand strong when the Sunday laws are passed. But you're not going to be able to stand then if you can't stand now. The prophet says if you have not kept up with the footmen, how are you going to be able to run with the horses? Now is the acceptable time. Make your calling and election sure. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study a word in this long and, 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 and detailed study, Lord. But we thank you for the truth that there is a mark of the beast, that the enemy is going to try and steal some out from among you. Now, Lord, that the, the forces of evil on this planet, Satan himself, will, will gather the world around his false day as a mockery to you and the true Sabbath. Father God, let us not be like the, 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 the people we read from these anti-Adventist places, Lord. Let us be committed and dedicated to following you all the way. Let us not look to the left or to the right, but let us look towards Christ Jesus. Let us study our Bible and know it for ourselves. And let Jesus be our only hope, our only surety, and the anchor with which we are held, firmly gripping the truth that will save us in these last days. Bless your people to this end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 